Hello, welcome to today's webinar, Navigating Changing Dynamics in the Energy Industry with Technology. Hello, everyone. My name is Jag Mukherjee, and I am a director at PwC's Strategy and, and I work in the power and utilities practice. I'll be your moderator for our discussion today. I'm so excited because we have an amazing panel of industry experts here, representing several perspectives on the future of electricity and power. There are more than 1,200 registrants in our audience today, representing many global power and utility companies, uh, almost covering one terawatt of global capacity. So before we begin, I have a few brief housekeeping announcements. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand. Today's event will be interactive, so please disable any pop-up blockers on your browser now. For a PDF of the presentation, click the green folder icon located at the bottom of your console. To submit a question at any time, click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, type in the question in the question box, then hit submit. We will be answering questions towards the end of our program today. So now, I'd like to start by asking each speaker on our panel to introduce themselves. Brian, would you like to begin? Sure, thanks, Jiggs. And thanks everyone for being on the call. Um, I'm Brian Hoff. I've been with a company here called Exxon Corporation. Later on, I'll walk a little bit through who, who Exxon is. But I've been with Exxon for 23 years. I've had a large um, number of different roles inside this organization. Um, I actually started off in our generation business, specifically at one of our nuclear power plants, Quad City Station. I was in an engineering nuclear oversight, a whole lot of roles inside of IT. Um, I ran our IT strategy group that's about a billion dollars to spend in IT. I was asked to put up a new function inside our corporation about three years ago, which is called corporate innovation. Inside this role, I look at three things. One, how to foster a culture of innovation inside Exelon. Two, how to launch new products and services that can ultimately be delivered to our customers along any of our business lines. And our third one is how to use a lot of these emerging digital technologies for productivity or efficiency gains. So that's a little bit about, my, about myself. Howard Francis, you? Hi, Jag, uh, and good uh, good morning, everyone on the call. Um, my name is uh, Frank O'Sullivan. Uh, I'm uh, the Director of Research here at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Energy Initiative, and I'm also on the faculty at MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, so uh, here at MIT, I am uh, leading our, our work on the utility of the future, um, and we're particularly focused, of course, on the major transitions that we're seeing uh, up and down the value chain uh, at the moment, um, the growth of renewables, the embracing of digitization across the, uh, across the sector, and so on. And uh, as part of that effort, I'm now co-directing uh, MIT's newly formed Electric Power Systems Center. Um, and uh, in addition, um, I've also just wrapped up um, serving as a senior advisor to the Secretary of Energy, the U.S. Secretary of Energy um, in the Obama administration, Secretary Moniz, um, with his work on, uh, on the utility of the future and the Quadrennial Energy Review. Excellent. Scott? Great. Uh, my name is Scott Bullock. Uh, just to echo Brian and thanking everybody for joining the call today. Uh, I am at GE. I am uh, sitting in both our GE Digital team as well as our GE Power team. Uh, my responsibility is to help GE build the products uh, that are necessary to improve the optimization of our fossil fuel plants, whether that be gas, uh, coal, or nuclear. Um, I've been at GE for just over three years now and uh, came into the industrial world from the digital world. I was actually uh, last at SAP for about eight years, uh, where when I left, I, I owned our solutions with regard to uh, manufacturing asset as well as R&D. Um, so it's an exciting ride uh, for me, uh, learning a lot about the industry here, and, and at the same time, hopefully uh, helping to drive the digital transformation within GE and across our customers. 
Excellent. Thank you, everyone. So just quickly going through the agenda for our discussion today, as I said, it's going to be interactive, but we do want to cover uh, some of the electricity global market perspectives, the role of digital, a bit about uh, the digital transformation in Exelon, and uh, we would leave uh, about 10 to 12 minutes uh, towards the end for Q&A. So to get things started, we have a poll question for the audience. Choose the top three energy market concerns your organization faces in 2017. A, remaining competitive in the global energy market. B, regulatory uncertainty. C, fuel prices. D, lagging behind in technology advancement. E, market shift towards renewables. F, workforce attrition, G, emergence of battery storage, H, aging infrastructure, I, don't have any. So Frank, as the results are coming in, what do you think of these results from a MIT perspective? Um, is anything surprising to you? Um, you know, Jack, I think that when, you know, if we step back and we look at the um, the energy market, oftentimes from the kind of perspective that places like MIT do, there's a lot of focus on uh, the new resources like, you know, renewables, battery storage, and so on, and what they might mean. But I think if we, if we put on, uh, you know, an operator's hat, if you wish, a stakeholder uh, in the value chain, and you think about, well, how, how does that really translate across into, um, you know, uh, boots on the ground issues, then I think this poll and the results that we're seeing here actually uh, make a whole lot of sense. Um, I think there's an absolute sense out there today that there is a big shift taking place in terms of the technology toolbox that's uh, that's available um, uh, up and down the uh, up and down the value chain, and um, participants in the markets I think are very concerned about what those new tools uh, mean for their business. How do they embrace them? How do they integrate them into what are often very long-standing processes? Um, so I think that's a very important issue. I think many uh, many many players, certainly not least Exelon, uh, have been very very proactive at ensuring that um, they embrace the uh, the uh, you know the technology advancement that's taking place. And of course, GE is at the forefront of that as well. Um, but I do think that it's an issue for the sector, and it's really really important to um, to focus on that. And then that of course couples across to the issues of uh, aging infrastructure and, uh, you know, how the existing infrastructure and the need to keep the lights on, frankly, in many contexts, how that can be coupled with, uh, with the deployment of these new technologies. And I suppose finally, you know, just looking at the poll results here, the, uh, the issue of remaining competitive, that all comes down to the very fact that these new technologies are, you know, in many instances uh, disruptive or at least potentially disruptive. And um, stakeholders really need to be careful, I think, and very proactive in terms of understanding the real implications, not necessarily the high level, this is how, you know, renewables might change the system or this is what storage is going to do, but at a more practical sense, this is the real kind of operational impact these assets are going to have and how they're going to affect the bottom line. Okay. Um, Brian, from Exelon's perspective, what do you think? You know, it, it's funny. I've been looking here through the poll results, too, and I, and I think if I were to be asked the question from an Exelon perspective, I'd be sitting here in these, you know, almost exact same um, categories. So, you know, when I really think about things like the assets that Exelon has, you know, and you'll again, you'll see a couple slides coming forward that, We've been looking definitely like how do we leverage digital technologies against our existing assets, especially the aging infrastructure, and figure out how do we do maintenance better, right? How do we bid that, that um, asset better into the grid? A lot of these technologies that we can now um, take further advantage of the digital is definitely enabling us to go past a lot of these challenges. Um, I even, I'm looking here at workforce attrition, right? We even have inside Exxon where a lot of employees 
did not like the older technologies that we were having them come in and work with. So as we continue to put newer technologies out, you actually find that employees want to stay here. They're really happy to be using the newer tools. We actually thought that was going to be a larger problem for us, that people didn't want to work on the newer technologies, but actually we're seeing the exact opposite. Okay, that's interesting. Scott, maybe you can speak uh, to GE's view on the global market space uh, from, from your vantage point. Yeah, I think we'll get into a little bit more uh, detail, but I, I think, you know, the, the things that jump out at me are really that the two highest here are uh, D and E, which is lagging behind the technology advancement and the market shift for renewables. And, you know, when you really look at the two in combination, uh, they, they really do uh, go together kind of like peanut butter and jelly. Um, if you think about it, renewables just put so much more pressure on the grid um, it puts so much more pressure on the fossil fuel to operate efficiently. And the only way you can really balance renewables, particularly as they start to penetrate at the 20% plus level, is if you've really got a technology in place. And so, you know, what really jumped out at me is, you know, trying to always read into the numbers is I think it's, it's part of that understanding that with renewables things are changing and that if you're not changing fast enough, not just on the renewable percentage, but also on the technology, then you're going to have a difficult time in the energy markets of the future. Okay, so let's uh, move on. Um, and maybe, Scott, uh, you can elaborate a bit more on the energy market perspective that you see going into the future. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I, although there's four segments here, I'll break this into kind of three uh, quick conversation points. I think if you look at the far left column, you know, the thing that is, is really most interesting in terms of the trends is you're, you're seeing really very different dynamics in the different markets. So if you take a look at Europe and North America, which is largely representative of that green bar, what you're seeing is that the demand is really flatlining or even coming down a little bit. But in, in contrast, if you look at, in particular, Asia with the China, the India, and the other bars, that's where you really see a lot of consumption growth. And so the first thing when you look at it is that, you know, there is energy growing. We always see this doubling of energy consumption in, in many reports. Uh, but that, you know, you have to double-click to really understand the dynamics of a given market. I think, second, if you look at the middle two uh, columns, uh, one thing that it really comes to mind is that there is no silver bullet to meeting the energy challenges of the future and simultaneously meeting the climate challenges that are there uh, before us. And that's why, if you look at it, you see, first of all, that renewables are, are undoubtedly going to grow. Um, and they are going to have the fastest growth. You know, in Europe, um, most recent year, 85% of the net new generation was renewables. And even if you look at China, 48% of the net new uh, generation in China is coming from, in the most recent year, renewables as well. But if you look at where we're going, gas continues to grow. And coal and nuclear, even out at 2035, still represent over one-third of the energy production. And so you're going to see um, gas grow. You're going to see the, a lot of the other fossils still be there. And that's going to be a, a challenge in terms of how do you look at these different assets? How do you think about dispatching them? How do you think about um, optimizing, in particular, those fossils? And, and uh, it's also going to put challenges on the grid. You know, and if you take a look at Germany and, and grid curtailment payments, and I believe it was 2015, went up 44%, 44 times year over year. So you're going to see a lot of different ways to make money. Um, you're going to see a lot of different dynamics uh, from the generation side. And then when you look at the right side, I think there's just a lot of unknowns uh, that are beginning to take off, and I think we're all trying to figure out where it's going to go. And uh, two of those big ones are electric vehicles and distributed energy. And certainly, you know, electric vehicles, uh, you're starting to see car companies talk about the death of the combustion engine and be very public about that. And, you know, those are those early signs that, you know, perhaps the electric vehicle forecast we have 
actually may be, may be uh, slower uh, than, than the actual uh, production and, and consumption of those may, may, may be. And as, as electric vehicles take on, and if you look at uh, other, uh, distributed energy, um, which is in, in Europe, you know, growing at uh, five times the central power generation, you start to see a lot of really interesting dynamics that when you look at it are going to go back and they're going to impact that first column on demand. They're going to impact those middle two columns in terms of energy consumption. So, you know, from our perspective, we, we feel as though fossil and centralized power is, is here to stay. It's going to be the overwhelming majority of the market. Renewables are growing. And then there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. And, and the one thing that all companies, um, all producers of electricity, distributors have to really face is understanding that uncertainty and putting themselves in a position to actually succeed against that uncertainty. Okay. Hey, Frank. So, uh, Frank, any, any comments from you and, and MIT building on any of those demand? mix or distributed energy? Yeah, Scott, thanks. Um, you know, just to kind of follow up, I think you gave a, you know, a very nice uh, kind of synthesis there of, of where we are and where we're going. Um, I think from our point of view, um, a few points um, that I think are worth raising. Um, so first, very clearly, um, the, the, the role of uh, fossil and, and indeed nuclear in many markets, I mean, is clearly going to be, uh, you know, uh, hugely important for the foreseeable future. And, and that's, I think that's an important realization, and it doesn't often come out in terms of the overall balance of discussion because uh, renewables tend to, uh, to garner a lot of the, the limelight in that respect. With that said, I think if we look at actual new capacity, then very clearly renewables and uh, the, the, the relative proportion of new capacity uh, coming from renewables is growing and the relative uh, competitiveness of those assets is really improving uh, and continues to improve quite dramatically. And what that's doing, I think, is it is fundamentally altering the shape of um, of energy markets, particularly in restructured markets. So the introduction of a lot of this zero variable cost or zero marginal cost uh, capacity uh, with the intermittency, with particular kind of temporal characteristics is really reshaping um, the, uh, you know, the price surface in many markets. And I think what, uh, what we're going through now and we will go through in, uh, in several markets, certainly it's happening across the United States and in Europe at the moment, is um, I think a repositioning, uh, the establishment of a new equilibrium in terms of what the market looks like, um, where the, where the rents are and how, uh, how the, uh, how, how prices are going to evolve uh, into the medium term. Um, and, and the story there then um, becomes one of, uh, you know, existing players in the market really needing to be responsive, uh, take their, their existing assets and really think about how are we going to deploy those assets going forward in a manner now that is more sympathetic to the new nature uh, of the market. And, you know, we're seeing this, I think, in particular with respect to gas assets, because clearly gas assets have a flexible character. Um, and we're going to see gas assets, I think, operate in a slightly different manner uh, into the medium term. Um, and, and that's going to be, you know, that's going to be a, a, a slightly new paradigm, but I think one that's going to be, uh, it's going to be successful. I think there's going to be a transitional period, um, but it's going to be successful for the, for the owners of those assets. And it's going to be the coupling of those two, of gas in particular, in my opinion, um, and renewables into the future that's really going to represent the, the kind of the, the big bulk or the momentum in the market. Um, one other issue that I do think is important also to appreciate is, you know, we are really seeing distributed assets in general now playing an increasing role. So actually, this past Monday, for example, here in the U.S., um, we saw that impact in KISO with the solar eclipse. You know, California has maybe five gigawatts of solar behind the meter, and there was a measurable impact uh, seen on the system because of that fact. Um, and these distributed assets, not just things like distributed solar, but demand response, and 
and other digitally enabled uh, assets, I think are going to play a greater role as well. So we're seeing this dynamic on the kind of the more traditional uh, upstream end of the uh, end of the value chain with respect to a rebalancing with uh, with new large scale renewables. But I think we're also seeing this kind of richer nature uh, downstream with these distributed assets. And I think that you know when you look at that. In, in, on the whole, what you just see is the real need for kind of embracing broadly the theme of digitization because it is that vector that is going to enable, um, you know, efficiency across the system, of course, and frankly, value creation for, uh, for, for stakeholders uh, in those markets. Very good. Uh, so to summarize... Uh big changes are happening in the electricity market today. And uh, that is expected to continue into the next uh, several decades. So next, uh, we would like to shift the discussion to the role of digital in all of this. So let's start again with a poll question. Uh, choose the top three ways technology can help your organization. A gaining maximum reliability from existing assets, B, driving greater operating efficiencies, C, protecting the operating environment, like cybersecurity, D, creating efficiencies in grid management, E, more reliable insights for business decisions based on data, F, managing workforce attrition with digitized knowledge, G, being flexible in dynamic energy markets, such as help with more frequent cycling, H, gaining greater environmental responsibility, such as emission controls, I, greater efficiency in fuel service with technology, J, attraction and retention of new talent with innovative technologies, K, none of the above. So the answers have started coming in. Going back to Frank again, what do you think of the results, Frank? Um, you know, I think if we if we look at the results here, you actually see that uh, you know many of these topics are clearly uh, on the minds of uh, of our attendees this morning, and and I think that speaks to the kind of universality of of digitization and its impact. Um, and I think, uh, curiously enough, the, the whole point of or the issue of driving greater operating efficiency, uh, clearly that's come out on top here. And I think that makes a whole lot of sense because that is a universal concept, okay? And if we look at, uh, if we look at the sector broadly um, and the enablement that digitization offers, you can deploy um, digitization up and down the value chain and have real positive impact in terms of the efficiencies, the operational efficiencies for, for all of those sectors. So, you know, looking to the upstream, for example, we've just discussed the kind of the dynamics that we're seeing today vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, the changing nature of the market with greater penetration of renewables and so on. Um, for, for existing asset owners, uh, I think here there's a great opportunity to realize that you need to continue to be extra lean if you're going to be competitive, frankly. Um, and so, you know, at the plant level, there's, a, there's an opportunity there to really look to the types of digital technologies, frankly, that GE, uh, GE is already able to offer to really drive plant level efficiencies so that you can be uh, lean and mean and competitive in this kind of changing market landscape. But then, you know, stepping back a little bit, you begin to see how uh, digitization is going to offer kind of greater overall um, uh, kind of optimization opportunities at the system level. So understanding the market and having a more responsive, uh, uh, re responsive set of assets, um, that being informed by a digital platform uh, that's uh, taking in all of the information now that's available and, you know, leveraging AI and so on to, to really really drive a, a more su uh, successful strategy in terms of asset deployment um, is becoming uh, ever more important. And then I think, you know, as we step down towards, towards the distribution level and so on, 
what you see there is just an absolutely new paradigm emerging. Um, digitization is offering the opportunity to, uh, you know, rethink entirely how uh, grids are operated, uh, how grids are operated reliably and in a resilient sense, uh, and how that's going to drive value for uh, for those asset owners and indeed ultimately for for you know for the customers at uh, and the end users. Um, so I think you know to see this pop out uh, makes a whole lot of sense here, and I think it just speaks to the kind of the universality of of digital and what it means uh, for the sector and what it will mean for the sector over the over the coming number of years. Okay, Brian, from an Exelon perspective, what do you think? You know, it's funny, is I, I, I usually am not a rule follower, so when I look at this and I see, you know, pick three, I have a hard time with that because you have to do them all, right? And I think from an Exxon perspective, too, like many of the companies, we have to figure out, you know, I'll call it throw the spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. And, of course, a lot of the operational efficiencies and um, just, you know, getting more out of our existing assets is exactly what stuck, right? But you definitely have to, at the same time, make sure that it's cyber secure. Right? Could you could you imagine the world that we're starting to digitize and it gets out there that this critical infrastructure that we have the privilege to operate, we're putting in digital systems that aren't secure, right? So you've got to continue to do all of these things at the same time. But definitely where we started a lot of our journey is around um, two major pieces, the assets and the people. So we've thought a lot about what are those technologies that we can digitally enable both the people that are working on these assets, right, and also the assets itself to get that greater productivity and um, operational excellence out of them. Okay. And, and Scott, from a GE's perspective, what, what, are, what are your views? Yeah, you know, I, I tend to uh, agree a lot with Brian on one level, but I think if we go to the, the slot in the next slide, you know, I think we also have a perspective on a pathway um, uh, that, that we're seeing in terms of uh, customer adoption. And so if you go forward one more slide, maybe. Um, what we see is, you know, we're a firm believer, obviously, with GE and the industrial Internet. Um, you know, we know that if you look at data, that only about 2% of the data that is actually collected is really mined, really used for insights that drive better decisions and, and operational improvement. And the World Economic Forum had a report uh, a couple of years ago that basically said, as you grow that 2%, there's the opportunity for 1.3 trillion of value for the energy sector. And that is really opportunity directly for the companies. And then, you know, I always like to put on two hats. One is what's that financial perspective? And the second, what is that sustainability or societal perspective as well? And equally important is that there's a $2 trillion societal uh, benefit when you look at uh, improvements in health, improvements in, in jobs. So we know that, you know, data is critical. And so with that belief, industrial Internet is important. In order to have an industrial Internet, you have to be able to connect assets. You have to be able to uh, drive digital twins and then begin to actually analyze that data. We believe that the logical first step is really to connect and, and digitize around that reliability goal. And uh, with that, you know, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to drive reliability up by 1% or 2% while simultaneously being able to drive down your, your O&M costs by up to 25%. And, you know, we're really happy in kind of uh, the business outcomes for our customers. We're, we're seeing that take place. Um, one example is BoardGas uh, that deployed our solutions at a 445-megawatt uh, uh, CCGT plant in Ireland you know, they were able to very rapidly save 2.2 uh, million euros in, in terms of spend. So we think that's the first step. We think the second step is once you have that data in place um, and, and you have that connectivity and you have digital twins that are real-time physics-based understanding of those machines, you then can start to do some optimization of the plant. Um, with, and you can also begin to take a look at that optimi optimization of those plants and connect that information to traders where you actually have better market engagement. And so when we take a look at, at uh, what we've seen there, you know, some of the examples are um, A to A 
uh, Chivazzo plant in Italy actually was mothballed um, because it couldn't keep up with, uh, it wasn't efficient enough, wasn't flexible enough to compete in a market where you had a high renewables penetration. Well, what we did there was we put in software that improved the efficiency. Uh, we put in software that was that enabled them to ramp up at 50 megawatts per minute, two and a half times faster than normal. And what that enabled them to do was actually compete in that market and use that stranded asset as an actual money-producing asset once again. And similarly, when you look at connecting plants to the trader, when you take a look at um, NRG and their Hunterstown plant, an 800-megawatt plant, they're now leveraging our digital twin model to be able to understand the actual capacity of that plant on a given day. And that generally allows them to trade somewhere between 2-3% more electricity, which gets them to a 3 to $5 million benefit over an outage cycle. So the second phase is really, okay, how do I really optimize at a plant level? And then if I'm looking at all my plants, and whether they're gas, whether they're renewables, whether they're nuclear, how do I appropriately and most profitably dispatch those plants to where I can optimize the margin or profit? And, and that's the, the second step. But the third step, what we see, is entirely new business models. And certainly, you know, what, 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 with leading companies, um, you know, such as Exelon, who you'll hear for from in a minute with Brian, you know, part of what they're looking at is, you know, hey, distributed energy, all this technology, how can we build new business models leveraging the relationship with our customers to extend the revenue stream beyond the electron, beyond that sale of uh, production, transmission, and sell of that electron. And, it, you know, once again, by being able to digitize at the beginning, putting in place that platform with that digitization and connect, moving up through optimization, that gives you the financial wherewithal and the experience necessary to really begin to innovate on new new solutions and new business models. So, you know, that's the transition we see. You know, Brian, I think you, you've got a little bit uh, of a of more of a nonlinear view of this than we do. Uh, but I, it, but which would be great to hear from uh, as you kick off into Exelon. But uh, certainly, this is our our view of the standard path that people choose. Yeah, Scott. And the only thing I'll just add on with you here is, if you think about this, the slides earlier we talked about low to flat demand growth. You have to look at things above that electron, right? What are those next things you can do? Because if you if you just keep doing what you're doing, you're not going to continue growth. That's why you know these two things play so nicely together. And, and Frank, uh, from your perspective, from MIT's research, uh, both Scott and Brian talked about business models and some very specific examples uh, from companies. Uh, do you see any particular area which is uh, very critical for digital adoption? So I think the digital adoption story, you know, we've, we've got – two very good tangible examples. I think we're going to hear about how Exelon at the kind of enterprise level has kind of embraced that. Um, uh, so I think, you know, the, the first high-level answer is that um, it, there's relevance up and down the value chain. I think it's very important to kind of appreciate that. I think the two places right now where you see uh, tremendous potential, and, and, and Scott brought this up, and I think it's I, – I, I want to emphasize this because it happens – we see this all the time uh, when we're working with partners. Um, entities will come to us and say, look, here we have a problem. For example, again, looking at a plant operation where we're changing market conditions, we're trying to understand how we take this asset and how are we going to uh, maintain this asset, how are we going to grow, grow value given, uh, given this asset and where it is um, and the market context that it's now operating in. And, um, and we say, well, that's great. Tell us, you know, what sort of data you have available and how are you leveraging that data to really drive your decision making? And, um, you know, I mean, frankly, a pretty universal answer is, well, we, we think we have a lot of data. We do have a lot of data, but we haven't even begun to unfold uh, or dive into what that data really means. So I think that, um, you know, the uh, people need to step back and say, all right, well, what are the assets that we have that we're not leveraging today uh, from a data point of view? And then from a, you know, what are the derivative insights that are going to flow from that? And then how are we going to bring systems online that really allow us to capture 
that information, that insight that's currently opaque, and to feed it back into our workflow, right, so that that becomes uh, something that becomes a knowledge base that's dynamic and that's learning. And this is a core principle, you know, of artificial intelligence, for example, is that you have a you have a learning database. So um, I think the uh, you know. Uh, players in that position today really need to quickly grasp the nettle and say, all right, we have to put in place processes and basically bring on board assets that will allow us to unlock the insights in that data. Because frankly, otherwise, other competitors are going to, and it's going to be increasingly difficult to compete in a market, which we all kind of now appreciate, where, you know, for example, the, uh, the value of the energy commodity is falling because you have more and more renewables coming onto the system, for example. Okay. So, um, Exelon came up a couple of times. So, I think uh, we want to take a moment and just examine how Exelon is driving their digital transformation. Uh, Brian, uh, can you take us through some of your objectives and tell us a little bit more about this transformation? Yeah, absolutely, and we'd be glad to. If you advance to the next slide, let me first start the story a little bit about who are we, right? So if you really stand back and look at Exelon, we've got now 34,000 employees, which for me, it, you know, is quite impressive. I've been here 23 years, and I remember, I think, uh, I think the company was like 8,000 at one point in my career. And we ultimately serve 12 million customers. So when we talk about these additional products and services, right, if you just stay within our footprint, there's 12 million people that can benefit, right, from that ultimately new innovations and things that we're building on top of, you know, any of our platforms. You see the numbers across here about our 33 million. 33,000 um, megawatts, right? So again, large generation fleet. We've got six different utilities, and you know it's gotten be, be quite a big, large, complex organization. And if you advance to the next slide, the one of the ways that we try to simplify this, and we think about this story here that we're talking about with digital, is if if you really think about it, really all all that is is excellence filled with people, processes, and these assets. And then across the middle, we look at what are these digital enablers? What are the things that are changing the way that the people, processes, and assets are acting today and what they're going to do in the future? You'll see the way we think a lot of these things about first is what we call our digital workers. Right? It's those people who are out there in the field working on either those generation equipment, our T&D infrastructure, even our individuals going inside the home right, or even inside the office. We've got personas that we think a lot about all of that workforce and how does these new digital technologies unlock the way that they can actually provide their current services or even future services. And then you look at things like drones and robotics. We look a lot at these digital technologies and we think about how do we have the drones actually provide inspection services for us? How can that drone go out and do a new product and service for us or a robot? Right in the middle of this, you'll see this AI that we have actually were just talking about. We've actually started to build an AI engine inside Exelon, and we're starting to use a lot of that with GE on top of the Predix platform, where we're really trying to learn from what are we seeing across all of these different um, assets and all the different uses that we're putting on top of that, so that we can actually have that to be a continuous cycle. As more and more of the adoption of sensors are out there, and that's the back to this industrial learning that Scott was referencing, right? We need it ultimately where we can put all of that dark data into a singular platform and look across the um, various silos that were occurring, and then how do you what do you do on top of that? Some advanced analytics. What that starts to see when you look to the right is you start to see a leaner workforce. You start to see where both the humans and the, su and the supervisors were, are managing people and bots. And there are both, what we've been doing a lot of work on is hardware robots and even software robots. So we're even looking at things like robotic process automation where we go in and actually have a software robot doing a lot of the activities that a human used to do. When, then what does a human do? More of the high-valued activity. We start to have these bots do more of the repetitive, dangerous, and difficult work. And even at our, across our contact centers, right, where people are calling in to Exelon ver, through our regulated utility or non-regulated um, call centers, that we even look at more and more how we use digital through that, that whole part of the chain. Then across the process, Exelon believes strongly in a thing that we call our management model. Our management model is how we operate all of our um, assets. We've actually started to realize that digital definitely improves that. So you start to see some of that highly um, automated processes like where those RPAs could fit. 
We've got initiatives that we've gotten rid of paper-based processes. We call this Go Digital. Anywhere across the company that we have major paper-based processes, we attack. So we were one of the first in our nuclear fleet to give people iPads. So the people are out there now doing their work following an I with an iPad. Again, at one point in time, that was pretty innovative. Now it's status quo that everybody expects when they go to do that job. They want an iPad or they want a digital thing. Who wants the binders of work? What we're now also taking that process is to be contextually aware. The person wants the information at the point of where they're at to come up to them. So we're looking at various things like head-mounted computers, um, where do you have like a Google Glass or those equivalent technologies, and actually have it where you know where that worker's at and that information is then being presented to them. Across the bottom, what you'll see is with these assets, when we use words like digital twins, we've now created the digital twins with General Electric that we look across all of our asset types and we start to look about how do we have digital twins, so digital power plants, how do we start having digital grid, how do we start to connect these legacy information systems that we have have to get more value out of them. So it looks quite complex here when you say it, but actually what we've done, again, back to that spaghetti model that I was referencing is, we looked across all of this, the people, processes, and our assets, started to figure out what made the most sense. We started both with engaging people, right, the people that are working on the assets with the, the right digital, and we started going after with GE a lot on the Predix platform on how to build out that digital twin. I said a mouthful. Did I, any thoughts there? Well, that's very interesting. Any reactions from Scott or Frank? I, I think the reaction I have, Brian, is always, um, you know, the, the, the balance in terms of getting those, those early wins and setting the platform and putting it in place and then the, the position to really begin to innovate on so many different levels. I think Exelon, you know, is one of those that I always look at because you really are able to balance both of those. And, um, and, and really lead the way, you know. And like you said, some of the things that people take for granted in other industries, you know, you led the way in terms of that automation of the manual processes and the paper processes on mobile. So, you know, I, I think when people look at this, I think it's important to recognize, you, you know, you need that broad digital view. You also have to take into consideration, you know, what's the starting point for you as an enterprise? You know, what is most important a salient problem that you're trying to solve. And starting yeah. there with the view of how you scale it, you know, really positions you for success. Yeah, and I think really, and Scott, thanks, is is the, and I'll tell everybody, right, minimal viable product. If you haven't used, heard, used that word, look into it, I'd start to look at it. We mean, it is humbling when you look across the scale of saying, I'm going to go deploy something across the entire fleet or across all six utilities. I mean, it's almost too big to get started. So you do try to figure out, and you know, just a little advice for people is what, what's the minimal test I could do while I do look at that broader, how it could scale once we get it running. You have to find that first, like who can I go test this with? How do I break it down into something that's reasonably, you know, and then after that, then go figure out how to, you know, use the power of the platform to deploy it across all your, all your asset types. Yeah, and, and Brian, maybe one last uh, comment just building on, on, on top of you is that, the one thing that I think you've done a great job of within Exelon is recognizing that it's a culture shift. So even when you talk about language and, you know, you all adopt, definitely adopt minimal viable product and agile, agile. and fast work fast. methodologies. And I, I think that's one thing that's really important as well is that a lot of times when we talk about the, the digitization, we, we think about the machines, but the, probably the most impart, important part of that journey is really beginning to, to change the mindset of the individual and upskill individuals in terms of new ways of thinking. And those new ways of thinking are, are, are process as well as, as understanding the technology. No, exactly right. And that if you, you've got to really pay attention to that culture change because the people have got to come along the journey with you. We actually do an annual thing that we call our Innovation Expo. We bring together you know, a, a large variety of people this year. I think we just had over 3,000 employees that came together in Washington, D.C., and we highlight some of the major innovations and things that are going, and even what are the employees' ideas. Like what are some of the things the people closest to the field have that we can take and incorporate and, and again, keep driving those across our platform? 
Excellent. Thanks, Brian. Uh, before we get to Q&A, uh, we will take a moment to tell you about an event that uh, I'm personally very excited about. Uh, Scott, uh, can you tell us a bit more about the upcoming Minds and Machines in October? Absolutely, and I'll go quick because I want to be able to get to some questions. We've got some good ones coming in. I, I think Minds and Machine is our annual conference. It's, uh, it's all about the industrial Internet. Um, it's approaching pretty quickly. It's October 25th and 26th in San Francisco. Um, and when you look at that photo, hopefully that's an enticement alone to come out to Minds and Machine and, uh, and visit our beautiful city. Uh, but more importantly, I think in, when you look at the conference, is it's just going to have – a, a large number of executives and operational uh, folks from leading uh, energy companies, AES, PSAG, Nova Scotia Power, and others, who are going to talk about their actual digital transformation experience. And I think this year what's really exciting to me is that we're really tailoring the event for two different paths. First of all, we'll have an executive track where executives can hear from their peers and industry experts on how va the value of data and real-world examples of how they're driving uh, profitability improvements for power and utility companies. And we'll have a second, more technical track where you can go deeper into the GE technology, uh, go much deeper into the demos with hands-on uh, sessions with, for IT and operations folks. So uh, we're really excited about it. It's going to be the best one ever. And uh, we certainly hope that many of the folks on the call here will be able to join us. Very good. It's uh, time for questions. Um, again, uh, just to repeat, if you want to ask a question, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, type your question into the question box, and then hit submit. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the time we have. So let's begin. So first question for Brian, how do I get everyone on board at my organization on the digital journey? So thanks. I would almost first start with you're never going to get everybody on, on, on board on the digital journey. So you know, back to almost like what I was referencing with the minimal viable product, you've got to find some major stakeholders that have got some pain, go out and win make some wins with them, show the value, show what you can actually deliver with that, and then actually go pretty hard with a marketing plan, even intern internal to your company, to start pushing, here's what the possibilities are. Even as I was referencing my Innovation Expo in D.C., that's my sixth one. We've been doing this now every year, and that alone has now got where more people are getting on board because they want to be highlighted. They want to see what's happening. And the people who weren't on the digital journey in the beginning are now finally coming on board. But I had to realize that I wasn't going to get everybody on the journey initially. Okay. Next question for Scott. Um, in your opinion, what is the best way to get started? Are there things I need to think of now that may be important for five or ten years from now? Um, in, in brackets, it says we have a multi-fuel source fleet, gas, and wind. Yeah, so I, look, I think um, I, I could answer that two ways. I think, you know, first of all, I, I just echo what, what Brian uh, said is figure out where you can start, where you can, uh, there's a, a real problem, it's a pressing problem, and you know that you can leverage technology to, to address that problem and, and actually turn it into an opportunity. And so, you know, if I were looking at a fleet, I would look at uh, a power plant uh, that is probably uh, challenged, uh, could be challenged from the market perspective or its performance and figure out how digital can go in and, and immediately add value to that plan. And that's kind of really at a tactical level. I think, you know, to echo some of the points that Brian made, if I look at a more strategic level, you know, I would make sure that, that one, people understand with that plant that you're laying a foundational platform that can be leveraged to uh, uh, with other plants and across the entire enterprise. And then I would figure out all about the people. And uh, three, three, three things I always think about with people. Uh, one is, you know, get your CEO engaged, right? Ultimately, every company can have a chief digital officer, 
Uh, but that chief digital officer's success really is dictated on whether or not the CEO is a believer. Um, two, really invest in talent. And, and that means creating a, a new type of worker that's a digital industrial worker. So, you know, go out and make those strategic digital hires and at the same time begin to figure out how you're going to change the mindset and upskill the industrial uh, uh, people. And then finally is, um, is process and fast works, you know. We call it FastWorks, which is really leveraging lean startup principles from Eric Reese and encouraging collaborative product iteration, uh, whatever you call it, you know, start to get that mindset into your organization because it's that agility uh, that isn't necessary just for, that is not only necessary for digital transformation, but also is necessary for you to succeed in, in challenging markets going forward. So. Start small, but as you start small, you know, begin to think about those steps that pave the way for, for bigger and broader adoption of digital. Hey, Frank, there's a, a question that's come in that I think you're u uniquely uh, suited here on the panel to, to address, which is, you know, you are seeing this death of the combustion engine start to pick up. And, and so what is that impact of electric cars going to be when we look at the economy and when we look at uh, electricity? Um, yeah, thanks, Scott. So, you know, you, you made remark to this um, uh, earlier in the presentation, the, the, the kind of the growing role for, for EVs. Um, you know, I think, frankly, um, we, we're just, uh, you know, we're just at the nascency now of an entirely new and exciting period for the utility sector, which is intimately coupled to, to this kind of nexus between um, uh, electricity and mobility forming. Um, you know, so right now, you know, there's probably two and a half million EVs, uh, full, full EVs and plug-ins uh, uh, in the global fleet. Uh, over the next uh, five or six years, that's expected to grow to somewhere between uh, 10 and 15. And, and you know, projections, uh, you know, into the future um, are really very, very large indeed. And I think, you know, what that represents uh, for for uh, for those utilities and those players where that adoption is going to happen, and that's going to be spatially variable, right? And I think that's important. But in those regions where that adoption is going to be uh, is going to be strong, I think that's going to represent a very interesting new opportunity to uh, grow value, to leverage the existing asset base that utilities have, and I think in particular to begin to uh, to innovate around the nature of the products that they're being served and. and and uh, we're already beginning to see some of that playing out. Uh, utilities looking to uh, looking to provide uh, EV users with uh, you know bespoke charging solutions, um, and and then you know the engagement between those assets, which are privately owned, those batteries, and the need for services at the at the grid level, and how those can be brought together. And again, that that falls into uh, or that's a that's a digitization story. Um, what I think is very interesting in that respect is that the um, the, the pace of change in that uh, or the, the dynamic in, in that particular re in that particular area is often focused on the question of uh, charging um, you know third party chargers or uh, you know public charging infrastructure and so on and there's a lot of focus on well really where are we in terms of the economics of that kind of infrastructure and so on but evidence from places like Norway where you've really had real world at scale adoption of these technologies shows that for the most part a lot of the uh, the vast majority actually of the charging and the load growth is simply coming from uh, charging at home and, and where that why that's interesting and why that's exciting is that that represents a vector to new value for many of these utilities without having to uh, uh, take on board the enormity of the uh, the infrastructure uh, investment for for a lot of that public charging so you know going forward i think we're going to see this as a particularly important um, opportunity for the sector to leverage both in terms of growing value at the commercial level, but uh, but also in terms of kind of innovating around uh, new uh, new offerings that weren't possible in the kind of uh, in the traditional uh, in the traditional market. 
All right. So the next question is for Brian. How does Exelon view future of DERs and managing them to utility distribution management like DOMS? Sorry, what was the second part of that like? Yeah, so how how does Exelon view future of DERs and managing them to utility distribution management, DOMS? Got it. So here's the first thing I will tell you is um, I am not directly on our utility side of our business. I'm at the corporate office, but I will tell you um, it is one of those ones we consistently are modeling, right? And in each one of our various footprints, you're seeing various um, different uh, adoption rates of D DERs, and it is one that we continuously look at, model, and you know, try to support through the through the various um, utility structures, you know, to adding those on onto our, our platform. But again, again, sorry, unfortunately, I don't have the direct knowledge of that for you. All right. So the next is for Scott. Doesn't going digital increase cyber risk? So look, I think cyber risk is is present, and it's present whether you're have your, you know, try to isolate your plant, whether you connect to the cloud. I, I think I would say two things. I'd say first, you know, everything we do, we take into consideration cyber. And so when we look at the connectivity, we're looking at how we secure the connectivity. When we look at the cloud, because a lot of our solutions are cloud-based, uh, we're embedding security throughout the cloud. So there is a, and, and then on top of that, when we look at, uh, at connecting any plant, one of the things we also always encourage is a cyber assessment where we can go plant by plant and understand the risks that may be there for that plant. So it's really a defense in depth approach, uh, looking at the, the security of the plant, looking at the connectivity in the cloud. You know, what we find is that when we're done with those assessments and that connectivity and the solutions are up and running, we believe customers are actually more secure than they were before. Uh, the second thing I, I think I'd say is that a lot of um, cyber security issues and it are and, and IT related uh, security issues, you know, are really just inherent with your operations and your processes. It's, you know, whether or not people have the right patches on their computers, it's whether or not you've got the right access controls. And uh, a lot of the attacks that you actually read about are attacks that have um, nothing to do with cloud on-premise. It's just uh, relatively rudimentary uh, cyber practices that actually are in the enterprises. And, you know, that's something that we work with uh, with our customers to make sure that, you know, not only when we look at the cloud, uh, but whenever we look at even what their normal operating procedures are with their on-premise solutions, how can we help them improve their cyber posture? And, and it's Brian here right. with Exxon. Just to to double down on that one a little bit with Scott, that's one of the reasons why I was mentioning earlier on about cyber when we went through that priority list. I think anyone, any one of us who operates critical infrastructure, right, has to have the right cyber controls. But just because you went digital doesn't mean that you, you know, you've now can't go digital. Like it's, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of the standards that are out there that can help you walk through how to uh, properly secure. They are ongoing and evolving standards. But at least from an Exxon perspective, I know we feel fairly comfortable with our security posture and using our defense and depth measures across our various um, asset types. But definitely, um, and GE has been a great partner in that, you know, move, moving that ball forward. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I think we can have one more uh, for Frank. Uh, can you give us some examples of utilities who are advanced in DOMS? Um, so I think uh, you know when we look around um, look around the world, you know, there the, u the utility sector in general is kind of at very you know has, has kind of uh, embraced this kind of new suite of technologies to varying degrees. Um, from my point of view, those that are more interested in the terms tend to, or that we've seen a lot of adoption and kind of quite a few, quite a lot of benefit from. Um, 
fall from the European context. So if we look at uh, Inogy or, or WE, for example, or uh, EDF, um, they've had a they've had a lot of success in that respect, and I think they're they're looking to kind of uh, you know leverage more of that kind of technology um, a, 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 a across their operations. I think here in the states, where you know we're because of the kind of you know, degree of fragmentation and so on, it's harder to give a direct answer. But but certainly where we are now is we are in a situation where, um, you know, all the stakeholders, and, and Brian just gave us an example, are looking at the, this broader suite of technologies and saying, okay, well, how are we going to bring these on board and how are we going to, to leverage them uh, for our specific operational needs? All right. I'm sorry, but we are out of time for today. Um, I'd like to give a big thank you to our panelists today for taking the time and for such a lively discussion. Thanks, guys. And thanks to our audience for, our, uh, for your uh, thoughtful questions. Go check out the next in GE's webinar series, which will uh, feature Richard Gaines, Director, Integrated Smart Operations Center for New York Power Authority. You can sign up now. Uh, thanks and goodbye, everyone. Thank you.